And the whole Dunkirk episode fills me even today with great shame. Um, I hate it. All this place was absolutely full of bodies, men lying about. And some walking into the sea. It was terrible. Our guns were trained on the fleeing people who couldn't defend themselves anymore and we fired on them like crazy. I've no idea why. We didn't see panic. Panic is, didn't exist. Everybody was too frightened to panic, I think. Normandy, El Alamein, Monte Cassino, battles that shaped the future of the world, the Ardennes, Arnhem. In World War II Revisited, we go back with soldiers who fought on both sides during those epic struggles. Men who, 60 years ago, were implacable enemies, meet now sometimes for the first time, at the scenes of some of the most brutal battles of the Second World War. In this program, an Englishman and a German come face to face on the French beaches at Dunkirk, where thousands of Allied soldiers escaped the clutches of the German army during May and June 1940. This is over 60 years ago, yeah. and here we are walking down the beaches. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Together. Yeah. I never thought it possible. Yeah. I didn't. Just incredible. This is Dunkirk, the seaport on the northern coast of France. Today, there are a few obvious reminders that it was once the scene of one of the great dramas of World War II, the so-called miracle of Dunkirk, when an entire army was ferried to safety by an armada of British ships. It was a glorious defeat that raised the spirits of the British nation, but confirmed the superiority of the German army. On the 10th of May, 1940, Hitler's armies turned their attention to Western Europe. The Germans, using every means of attack possible, had crushed Poland, Norway, and Denmark. This was Blitzkrieg, meaning lightning war. Now it was the turn of France, Belgium, and Holland to feel the full might of the German forces, led by the fearsome Panzer divisions and supported from the air by the Luftwaffe. On the very same day that the German attack on Western Europe began, Winston Churchill succeeded Neville Chamberlain as British Prime Minister. Churchill and his new coalition government were immediately faced by an unhappy and serious state of affairs. 28 German divisions were sweeping through the Low Countries towards France and the northern coast.
The Germans were attacking on three fronts. Holland surrendered on the 14th of May, while Army Group B was attacking Belgium. Thinking this to be the main German attack, ten divisions of what was called the British Expeditionary Force, along with the French 1st and 7th Armies, were sent to meet them. They soon realised, however, that to the south, the Germans were also thundering through France. At the time that the Germans invaded the Low Countries, we were on exercise in the area of the Somme. On hearing the news, our unit immediately moved back and with a temporary halt in Cisville to collect all our gear, we moved forward into Belgium. We got tremendous reception from the Belgians, cheering crowds everywhere. Um, we were amazed that the Germans made no effort to try and stop us, because of course they were dead keen that we, we should go up there. We moved straight up to the River Dial, which was the first obstacle in front of the Germ advancing Germans. And there we demolished a number of bridges uh, in the hope of preventing the German onslaught. The French had always assumed that the Ardennes was impenetrable for tanks. And so they'd got their reserve army stationed there which um, broke fairly rapidly under the blitzkrieg. The Allied armies were unable to halt the rapid German advance, and by the 21st of May, the French and British forces were completely separated, split in two by the speed and effectiveness of blitzkrieg. We marched over Belgium, the Albert Canal to the English Channel. Canal vorgestoßen. Und zwar über diesen Albert the Albert Canal, Canal had been taken by parachute units jumping out from gliders, so that we were able to march through without a problem. Und wir konnten freiweg durchmarschieren. There was now the likelihood of a Belgian surrender and the British were faced with the prospect of losing their access to the Channel ports, the lifeline of the British forces. Supplies were also running low. There was little to be done. Its commander, General Lord Gort, requested that the British War Office make plans to evacuate his army from France. We were told, to our amazement and bewilderment, that we were going to withdraw, because the French had apparently given way on our right flank. The Germans had broken through at Sedan and the Ardennes and were racing towards the Channel ports and our right flank was exposed. So um, off we set, backwards, and that was the start of the withdrawal, which was to last a fortnight and take us to the beaches of Dunkirk. Gort had selected Dunkirk as the place from which to rescue the British forces. The task of organising the evacuation in Britain was given to Vice Admiral Bertram Ramsey, the commander of Dover, and it was codenamed Operation Dynamo. Ordered to retreat, the British troops began to fall back towards the coast. Bob Pendleton, who was then a signalman in the 46th Nottingham Division, had just met a girl called Simone in the Belgian town of Lesquin when the orders for the withdrawal came through. He was worried about what might happen to her. The last time I saw Simone and her mother and father, her father were pulling a, a cart and uh, taking the belongings and they're joining the millions of people that were walking on the top road away from us, you know. I'll not forget that day. It was terrible. I thought afterwards many times that if I'd have had my wits about me and any sense at all, she could have got dressed in soldier's clothes and I could have taken her out on the bike and got her across to England, you know. But anyway, that's how it happened. 
More than 60 years on from the events at Dunkirk, Bob Pendleton returned to the beaches to meet Georg Lehrmann, who served in the 20th Artillery Regiment, one of the German units pushing the British troops back through Belgium and France. They met in front of one of the many memorials commemorating the Dunkirk evacuation. Hello. Hello. Very pleased to meet you. Many years have passed, but this will be a good memory. Well, the point is it's been a long, long time. It was many years ago, but nevertheless, there were bad memories, but now, a good one. I know I thought I'd shake hands with the German, but honestly, it's great. Thank you very much. Discover the past with exclusive military history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians, all on History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to watch everything, from the gripping story of the Band of Brothers to Operation Barbarossa and D-Day. Immerse yourself in the dramatic stories of this remarkable era by signing up via the link in the description. I am here. I am very pleased to be able to come here and that there has been no war for such a long time. But when I think about what was done here, then it gives me a strange feeling. Men firing at other men who cannot defend themselves. That is the reason I came here and to refresh the memories. Yes, yeah, it was more that way. Yeah. When I came over here, Originally, I was issued with 12 bullets, 12 4.5 bullets. I didn't have a gun, I just had the 12 bullets with nothing and a motorcycle. That's what I came over with, with one brain gun in a battalion, with nothing. And there we were supposed to fight the Germans, just impossible. Throughout the middle of May 1940, the German army, of which Georg Lehrmann was a part, raced through Belgium and France. General Lord Gort withdrew the British forces to a final position along the canal line of the rivers Isser, Scarpe and Ah. He'd hoped that help would come from the towns of Boulogne and Calais, but Boulogne fell into German hands on the 24th of May, while Calais, despite an epic defensive action by the 1st Battalion of the Rifle Brigade, was captured two days later. First of all, we saw the Stukas and the explosions from our artillery. But it didn't last long. It lasted about two hours, and then we had to stop firing, and I was given the order to drive into France. In Richtung Frankreich to fahren. The position looked hopeless for the British Army. We didn't know what was going on. I suspect that nobody did. And we were a bit scared of these snookers that kept dropping the odd bomb here and there. But nevertheless, this disillusionment and fear, I don't think in any way prevented us from carrying out our normal soldiery duties. We would withdraw during the night, about an hour after everybody else had left already. So it was a very lonely business, waiting for an hour to elapse before you could withdraw your salt. And then withdrawing through the darkness, terrified of losing your way, uh, arriving at a new position behind another river, digging in in the early hours of the morning, and during part of the day, uh, waiting for the German onslaught, and then doing exactly the same the following night. Six Frenchmen pulled me up with their rifles. They said, Anglais parti. I said, no, I said, we're here. I didn't know about Dunkirk then. Oh, parti, Dunkirk. I said, how do you mean Dunkirk? I said, Anglais, Parti. And that's the first I knew about 
evacuation from Dunkirk. And this would be about 10 days before we got there, before, before I got there anyway. They had a powerful, seemingly unstoppable enemy in front of them and the North Sea at their back. In Britain, there were dark predictions that perhaps only 50,000 men from the entire army could be saved. With more than four times that number of British troops in France, it did not look good. The British Admiralty soon realized that to evacuate more than 200,000 troops from Dunkirk, it would need a larger fleet of ships than was currently available. It was now that a desperate appeal went out to all owners of small boats to come to the aid of the Royal Navy. This flotilla of little ships made Dunkirk the stuff of legend. Every conceivable type of sailing craft, yachts, fishing boats, pleasure boats, steam packets and barges, turned up on the south coast or in the Thames estuary to help with the evacuation. They were to play a major role in the coming days. Meanwhile, the net began to close still further on the British, Belgian and French troops fighting to keep the German army at bay and to head towards the beaches. Two of us had stayed behind to blow up an obstacle in France. And as we were blowing it up, we could hear the German troops marching down the road. And my colleague and I hid in a ditch and covered ourselves up while these German soldiers marched past, singing the horse vessel. Every foot, every yard of ground was contested, and gradually the number of casualties among soldiers and civilians alike began to increase. I was passing a house, a large house it was, and there's a soldier at the door, and he called me over. He said, uh, is there anything you can do for me? I said, why? He said, well, I've got all these men in here. I said, well, we've got to Dunkirk. Oh, no, he says, they're all wounded. I said, I have no, no means of getting them away. I just didn't know what to do about them. I said, there's nothing I can do about them, sorry. But it was not a nice feeling. The Stukas came down and bombed the convoy where many, many horses and men were, were killed and it was a dreadful sight. The lorries, for example, and the guns, they weren't just left standing, they had been tipped over and from that you could tell that the men who had used them had needed to get away quickly. They'd been driven into ditches and tipped over. There was a great deal of bombing at this time, Stuka and I bombing, but principally on the roads against the refugees, uh, which was a horrible sight. The bombs would come down and they would run in all directions and very often they would get hit so that you would have women and children lying dead in the roadway amidst all their belongings over the very road which you had got to drive in your trucks. And um, so you obviously did your best to avoid running over anything, but it was just constant uh, all the way back when it had Dunkirk. This was a critical point in the evacuation. The unrelenting German attacks could have destroyed the Allies caught in northern France. But Hitler made a key decision that helped the Allies in their retreat to Dunkirk. Because he needed to conquer the rest of France, Hitler wanted to rest his armies. And on the 24th of May, he ordered a temporary halt to the 4th Army's advance. They were to take two days to rest and resupply. This gave the Allies a crucial breathing space. With the lull in the fighting, the thoughts of some German soldiers turned to plundering their newly conquered territory. But the breaking of army regulations or any displays of indiscipline were swiftly dealt with by the German army command, as Georg Lehrmann witnessed. 
Here in Nandi is a city where we had four hours pause. In a town close by here, we had a break for four hours one night, and in the morning, we had to line up. And one of our soldiers had forcibly raped a girl at gunpoint, and we all gathered together at the town hall marketplace, and he was executed the same day. A measure to ensure that all soldiers knew what was going on, that during the war, such acts would be punished by death. There was one other factor that persuaded Hitler to order a lull in the fighting. This was the assurance by Hermann Göring that his Luftwaffe could and would destroy the Allied troops in the pocket around Dunkirk on their own from the air. We started moving towards Dunkirk. We knew where it was for two reasons. We could see the pall of smoke emanating from the burning oil refiner in there. And also, to be quite honestly, it's a case of follow the Stukas all the way to Dunkirk. They arrived in waves, the same ones flew over repeatedly. All we heard was the wailing siren. It dived and boom. During the unexpected respite, there were other crucial developments that helped the Allied cause. Captured German orders revealed a plan to attack in an area between Ypres and Menin, and General Lord Galt was able to send reinforcements, thereby thwarting a breakthrough that could have spelt disaster for the Allied evacuation. In Britain, experts began to unlock the secrets of the captured Enigma coding machine, meaning that as the Germans rested, Gort was able to receive their decrypted messages. All of this helped to ease some of the pressure on the Allies. We were beginning to get really very tired. I think at the age of 18, 19, 20, you haven't got the stamina that you would get later. And it was very difficult to keep awake. And a typical example, I was um, bring up the rear of my platoon late one night and the column came to a halt and we weren't moving and weren't moving and weren't moving so eventually I got out of my truck and walked forward to the front of the column and there was my platoon sergeant and his driver fast asleep in their truck. I lost a bit of weight. I come down to nine stone. I was 11 stone when I originally when I started. I came down, I'd, I'd lost two stone in weight and uh, a bit thin, gaunt. Um, but otherwise it was all right, you know, just a matter of keeping going and getting to eat what I could. By the time hostilities were fully resumed on the 27th of May, the Allied defensive positions around Dunkirk had been fully organized and the first troops had begun to sail for home. It was not before time. On the same day, Belgium formally surrendered. Inside the defensive ring, however, was a mass of seething humanity. 360,000 British, French and Belgian troops, alongside more than a quarter of a million civilians, were packed into an area totaling less than 100 square miles. Military transports, trucks, tanks, lorries lined the lanes and streets in their thousands. I shall never forget my first views of the Dunkirk area. It was like a vehicle scrapyard. There were disabled vehicles lying on either side of the road with barely room for people to get through. And it must be borne in mind that all this time, and with all this movement we made, we were hampered by the refugee columns streaming away from the Germans.
Wir haben gesehen, wie die Stuckers da reingefahren sind und wie die Leute. We saw the Stuckers fly in, and that the men had left everything lying around. We saw all the vehicles and the trains. Everything had been abandoned, so the men must have run away. We saw it all. The officers probably knew as little as we did, but we were sent in. We were told that we had to prevent the English departure. With the pocket gradually being reduced by the German pressure, Bob Pendleton was ordered to go to Berg, a town 10 miles from Dunkirk, to deliver a message telling the troops there to fall back. I came in over the bridge, over the grass verge, parked the bike on the right-hand side, looked round, everything was on fire. It was devastation, it was absolute chaos. There was nothing moving about. And the whole town being on fire, everything being blazing, I had to get towels and wrap them around my head. I used the canal to dampen the towels and wrap them round so that I wasn't affected by it. I had to walk from leaving the motorcycle to the town hall, get down to the cellars, get these men out, tell them, inform them that they had to get to Dunkirk. The only way they could do it was a walking. With the Allies in such disarray, the Germans seemed to somehow hold back. Why the Germans didn't attack all parts of the Allied defences more vigorously is a mystery that's remained for the last 60 years. I felt they were about probably eight miles away, eight or nine miles away. I thought they'd just come through and, and capture us and take us because we had nothing to defend ourselves with. So it's just a matter of waiting for them, waiting for them to appear. But they never appeared. The Germans made rapid inroads to the south, but strangely, in the centre and to the north, hardly advanced at all. There is one outlandish theory that, to secure a swift peace agreement with the British, Hitler deliberately allowed them to make their dramatic escape from Dunkirk. I think there was a bridge over a canal, I seem to remember, and there was a defensive position had been built up there. Uh, in fact, one of my best friends who I got, uh, I joined the army with, um, he got killed uh, there a bit later on, holding the bridgehead while we all evacuated ourselves from the, from the beaches. So uh, not everyone got away from Dunkirk. From the 26th of May, the great rescue of the Allied forces at Dunkirk began. While British and French troops fought to defend the town itself, a remarkable fleet of ships had arrived off the French coast in order to ferry the besieged troops back to Britain. You came eventually in sight of the sea and um, there was this great pall of smoke to our left, which was Dunkirk, the oil tanks and so on blazing there. And then in front, there were these great lines of soldiers uh, up to their waist and necks, stretching into the sea. The fleet included more than 40 British, French, Belgian and Dutch ships of all types. From destroyers to minesweepers, sloops to personnel ships, all came to aid their allies in their desperate hour of need. And of course, there were the famous little ships, more than 900 of them, in all shapes and sizes. For the little ships, though, it was certainly no pleasure cruise. From the skies above came the German dive bombers and machine gun fire. From the shore came the shells of the German artillery. Georg Lehrmann was in an artillery regiment that had been ordered to prevent the Allied evacuation. 
I'll be honest, I cried. When they said that we should fire into the men, you can't do that. They had no weapons, nothing at all. And we were able to fire with artillery, we had rifles, and the infantry was there as well. They had no means of defense, they had thrown away their weapons. They weren't running around defending themselves, they were on the beach and trying to reach the boats. I remember coming across a French soldier who had obviously just been in a bombing raid. He had one eyeball hanging down his cheek and he was screaming for help. And I was not much good at coping with a situation like that. There were queues and queues of men waiting to embark. In fact, that was one of the reasons we thought it might be a bad place to be. And the area was being bombed all the time. And so we moved down about 500 yards away from here, dug into the sand dunes and waited. The first thing we all wanted was some sleep. So we got into the sand dunes and we went to sleep. And people often say to me how awful the dive bombing must have been. So on. we slept through, uh, slept for, I think we must have slept for about 24 hours. We were so tired. The sailors of the privately owned volunteer craft put their lives on the line as the great evacuation continued. The cost was high. By the time the evacuation officially ended on the 4th of June, nearly 250 of the small craft had been destroyed almost a third of those that had taken part. The most successful day was on the 30th of May, when 53,000 men were ferried back to Britain. Many small ships made the journey across the Channel several times, as the German Army and Air Force continued to pound the unfortunate souls on the beaches who were waiting for their turn to embark. All they wanted to do was get away, get away from the beaches and get over to England. That was the main thing. I mean, the point being, there were so many men, it was just impossible to move without them. Loads of them all over the place. We have we stood up here on the dunes and watched the men trying to get away in the boats. And it was difficult. Bob spoke about it. They couldn't land properly. They had to go into the water and then into the boats, and that took time. Some soldiers who thought that they'd reached safety on the escaping boats soon found it was a case of out of the frying pan into the fire. A couple of destroyers came in shore and we joined the queue of men embarking on these destroyers. However, we chose the wrong one because hardly had we set sail in the destroyer when it was hit. A direct hit from an aircraft, and all the forecastle of the destroyer was blown out. We were fortunately on the deck, and many men were wounded. However, another destroyer, and I remember the name of it now, it was HMS Malcolm, came alongside, and we were able to be honest, throw the wounded across to the Malcolm and eventually scrambled across uh, our turtles and we set sail. In these most trying and dangerous of circumstances, the troops maintained an almost superhuman discipline, even though for some it was three days before they were able to leave the shore. I met the adjutant of our battalion on the beach. And he said, ah, good to see you. Uh, right, get your platoon off back to England now. And I said, right, sir, how do I do that? He said, oh, use your initiative. So, um, second lieutenant Martin 
then faced with how to get his platoon of about 30 soldiers back to England. Before Bob Pendleton could leave the Dunkirk beaches, his brigadier gave him one last message to deliver to the British troops holding out on the defensive line. It was time for them to leave and get to the beaches. I went up to this farm, turned right at the top two year old, went to the farm, no sign of anybody except the farmer and his lasses. So I went back again to the old man. I said, they're not there. He said, well, they wouldn't retire. I said, they must have done. So he shook my hands. He says, uh, try again, lad. So I went back up there, turned right at the T road. They're right in front of 50 yards away. They advanced to the German SS with the machine guns, sight cars, everything, you know. So I didn't take, take any more to do, but I turned that bike down very, very quickly and uh, made sure they weren't following me. Go back to the old man, I said, well, I know they're not there now. He says, why? I said, because the jerrys are there. Oh, he said, I thought they might be. He says, we can now go to Dunkirk. By nightfall on the 1st of June, real and spectacular progress had been made. Only three divisions of the British Expeditionary Force remained ashore. By the following day, they'd all been evacuated. We started off rowing towards a destroyer we could vaguely see silhouetted against the night sky. And suddenly, when we were about 400 yards away from the destroyer, we heard the anchor chain coming up. And we could see it in silhouette, see it was swinging round and heading towards England. And with that, a padre who was sitting in the middle of our boat I don't know who he was or where he came from, suddenly leapt to his feet, flung his arms out like that, and shouted, Lord, Lord, why hast thou forsaken us? And 40 soldiers, as one, shouted, Sit down! Because as he leapt to his feet, I think rocked like that, water came sloshing over. And that great shout echoed across the water to the destroyer, which came and picked us up. The defences around the town were being manned only by French troops, who fought doggedly on against the great tide of the German army. It was only a matter of time before they were engulfed completely. On the 3rd and 4th of June, British ships returned to rescue as many as possible from the beaches. Bob Pendleton was one of the last to leave. There were some British uh, fishing tracks on the pier. They were the only ones that could get in. All the pier was full of blazing ships and one thing and another, you know. Over there I was, by that pier. That's how we escaped. The pier had been blown away. Ten footer blown away completely. Built up by some planks that we found. Rode a motorcycle over. And that's how we escaped. Climbed down the side of the pier. These broad beams. Very slippy. I did about five trips on the motorcycle and then I let the motorbike go into the sea and I tried to climb down the pier. As I was climbing down, I slipped. I was about halfway down and I fell. And the fisherman caught me and into the boat. And that's how we got away. Everyone realised that it was senseless. The men at the guns didn't see it, but the infantrymen, they stopped. And I noticed that less and less guns were firing.
Inevitably, Dunkirk fell, and the final troops were evacuated on the 4th of June. Even so, some 40,000 Frenchmen were left behind. Operation Dynamo, the evacuation of Dunkirk, had been a relative success. Given the gloomy predictions of late May, it was incredible that 338,226 Allied troops had been borne to safety. 139,000 of these were French and Belgian. We came back to England, landed at Ramsgate, and uh, got up to the top of the, to climb up the pier, go up to the top and there was the last there with the WVS wagon, three or four girls on. Come on lads, come on, cup of tea, jam sandwich. And it, you know, it was marvellous. Beautiful was that jam sandwich. When we got to Dover, we were a bit punch drunk. Uh, we didn't really know what was going on, any more than anybody else knew what was going on. And as I say, we were just extremely grateful to see these wonderful ladies coming along and helping. We felt thoroughly demoralised and awful. We'd run away. Our fathers had fought for four long years in France and had never given way and we'd been in action for a fortnight. We'd hardly seen any real fighting. No matter how the returning troops felt, there was understandable joy and relief throughout Great Britain that so many had escaped. Harsh reality soon tempered people's enthusiasm. The country was now at the mercy of the Germans. Although Britain's army had been delivered virtually intact, Almost all of its equipment was still in France, in the hands of its enemies. All tanks and transport had been lost. 2,500 guns, 70,000 vehicles, and half a million tons of ammunition had all been left in the wreckage of Dunkirk. It had been a victory to boost morale, but little else. We were all marched off to the gymnasium and told to sit down on the floor. And there was a gallery overlooking the floor, and out onto the gallery strode a full colonel with a red cap. And he said, Welcome home, heroes of the BEF. And we thought, Heroes? <clears throat> and he, <coughs> he went on to talk for at some length on what a wonderful show we put up against overwhelming odds. And by the end of it, we really felt very much better. So that, in fact, when we eventually got home on leave, we were greeted everywhere as heroes. But I, I knew in my heart of hearts we weren't heroes at all. The Dunkirk saga also did little for Anglo-French relations. The Vichy government that was soon established in France coined the phrase perfidious Albion, as it accused Britain of abandoning its allies in an all-out attempt to save its own army. Many think this an unfounded slur that denigrated the heroic efforts of the evacuation fleet and insulted the memory of those that had given their lives. Winston Churchill attempted to calm Britain's euphoric mood in the wake of Dunkirk. Wars are not won by evacuations, warned the new Prime Minister, as he tried to prepare the country for the dark days ahead. The events at Dunkirk were, however, truly extraordinary, and those who lived through them will never forget. Frightening, but uplifting. Uplifting because of the spirit of the people on the beaches. 
everyone talked about the miracle of Dunkirk and uh, it seemed to be a miracle that so many of us got off. It was a miracle the water was so calm, um, that the weather was good and that the Germans didn't try and launch the final killer blow which they could have done so easily, I felt. This is the first time I've been back. And for me, there are, of course, good and bad memories. I look at it like this. The war was not necessary. We didn't know why the war took place. A lot on it as though we'd been defeated in France, which we were. And then afterwards, as the war went on, you realized that you were going to win eventually. Well, that was a great feeling.